Hi, it's Roland Jones. Thanks for starting to watch my video. I hope you continue throughout the whole video on basic fraudulent conveyance law. This is not just yada, yada, yada. This, is, this video is in no way legal advice on your, uh, if you are being sued in your specific case. If you're being sued, uh, my advice is to retain a lawyer as this area is pretty complicated. Um, I think if you don't retain a lawyer, it's going to be hard to defend yourself, pro se. Uh, if you are a client of mine, this video is still not legal advice. If you have specific questions about your case, uh, we'll discuss them all. We'll discuss them together or feel free to uh, email me questions uh, after the video. Okay, fraudulent transfers are controlled by 11 USC 548. That's the part of the bankruptcy code, which I'll go into more specifically later, that controls and sets out the laws with respect to fraudulent transfers or fraudulent conveyances. That's the same thing. Conveyances and transfers is just is interchangeable. What is a fraudulent transfer? Um, most folks and companies, when they get sued for a fraudulent transfer, they're like, you know, what the heck is this? Why am I even being sued? I didn't do anything wrong. Um, how is this possible? Um, it's a little bit like being confronted with death. At first there's denial. Who? Me? Must be a mistake. Uh, then there's anger. <laughs> how is this even possible? And then there's acceptance. And that's usually when I get a call. The first thing you got to know is that this law has been around since the 1500s. It's it, it, the law began. Well, it was first. I bet it was around for much longer than that. But it was the first time we we know that it's been codified, and our law derives from that law is uh, is English law in the uh, in the era in the uh, Elizabethan uh, era, time of Shakespeare. So that is a very very old law. And and when you see this video, it'll make sense to you. Um, my definition, and you're not going to find this in any textbook, and I certainly would not put this in any brief, and it's a gross simplification, but with that warning, uh, my simple definition is it's a pre-bankruptcy transfer of property while the debtor is insolvent, doesn't have enough money to pay everybody, which results in creditors, people who owe money, getting less money or no money after a bankruptcy is filed. That's my simple definition. And I'll go into specific examples. These, these are the types of examples I'm going to go into. Parking assets, sweetheart deals, bad deals, Ponzi schemes, and what I call fraudulent conspiracies against third parties who, who then become creditors of the bankruptcy estate. So parking assets, what's that about? So Bill owes, Bill is in business. He borrows a, a lot of money from Tom, Dick and Harry. Bill goes, uh, Bill sees his business is going south. He's not gonna be able to pay these guys. Uh, and he's got assets. Uh, he's got assets in his house. And he's, he's thinking to himself, hey, I'm not gonna have anything if I pay all these guys. So what am I gonna do? Well, uh, Tom, Dick, and Harry come knocking on the front door, and Bill and Bill ships his assets uh, out the back door to uh, to Mary. He says to Mary, "Look, I, I'm in. Uh, I got a situation here. Can you hold up to my assets until all this blows over?" And Mary says, "Sure." So she takes the assets, and uh, and then there's a bankruptcy filing, and voila, Bill has no assets. So the trustee is appointed, and. Uh, his job is to protect Tom, Dick, and Harry. And so he sues Mary and says, look, you didn't pay anything. This was a fraudulent transfer to you by Bill. It's not fair to Tom, Dick, and Harry, their own money. Uh, so you have to give it back. And that's the example of parking assets. As you can imagine, this is, this is as old as the hills. Another example is a little bit different. Um, same fact scenario. Yeah, this time, uh, Bill, uh, let's say, sells, let's say his assets consist of jewelry in the house. His jewelry is worth $100,000. He sells these assets to Mary for $50,000. Uh, 
Why? Because uh, he likes he likes Mary, or maybe they're going to do business together, or maybe Mary is going to pay him back later. Who knows what it is? Um, trustee is appointed, uh, sues Mary. Why? Because she didn't pay reasonable value for the assets. So why is he suing her? Because it's unfair to Tom, Dick, and Harry. They're only getting you're only going to find fifty thousand in the house, but really there should be a hundred thousand. So that's an example of a of a sweetheart deal. And again, I'm giving very simple examples so that um, uh, you know the concepts are easy to understand. Ponzi schemes and fraudulent conspiracies against third parties have become crowders. Uh, as a bankruptcy attorney specializing in this area, I've seen so many Ponzi schemes in the last five to ten years. Uh, it feels like half the country is running Ponzi schemes and the other half is investing in them. I'm going to take these one by one. So what's the relationship of fraudulent conveyance law and Ponzi schemes? Well, Ponzi scheme, uh, if you're paid a so-called profit, that's just money that was stolen from somebody else. It's a false profit. Tom invests 100K and gets back 150K. The so-called profit of 50K came from, comes from Bill, who invested 100K after Tom. Bill's money is used, part, part of Bill's money is used to pay Tom. And it goes on and on and on. At some point, the music stops and somebody doesn't get a chair. Some, some investors don't get paid anything. These, uh, these folks uh, are victims and they're the creditors of the bankruptcy estate. Basically, the trustee is suing uh, those investors that got false profits so that all, all creditors, including the victims and the winners, so-called winners, are treated equally by the bankruptcy estate. It's a matter of fundamental fairness. Uh, it's not fair for the winners to keep money belonging to, to the victims. That's what bankruptcy is all about. It's creating a level playing field. It's making things fair. Um, that's why the trustee sues uh, to get false profits back in a Ponzi scheme. This fact pattern is a little more unusual and controversial as far as the law goes. And I'll go into more detail later. Um, but in this fact pattern, you have a fraudulent conspiracy. The debtor steals money from victims who then become creditors of the later bankruptcy estate. Uh, but the debtor doesn't do it alone. He has help from others. These others are paid by the debtor. So the conspiracy, the, I'll call them the conspirator. The conspirator gets paid to perpetuate a fraudulent scheme against creditors. Um, and, and the trustee sues these conspirators. What, what's the theory behind that? Conspirators' actions don't benefit the debtor or creditors of the debtor. Conspirators' actions actually hurt creditors by creating more creditors. If they're successful in bringing more people into the debtor's fraudulent scheme um, then it just creates more victims and what happens there there at once a bankruptcy is filed you have more creditors what happens when you have more creditors each gets less of the bankruptcy estate there's there are more credit you know it's the same size pie but there are more people eating that's the easy way to look at it i'm going to go into this fact pattern in more detail later this is the actual statute, 548A, trustee may avoid, I'm going to skip the complexities, may avoid any transfer of property. And the, the reach back period is two years under 548A. 548A talks about an actual intent to hinder, delay, or defraud. So it's looking at a state of mind here, actual intent. 548A1B um, is, is called a constructive fraudulent conveyance part of the statute. The, the other part of the statute is called the actual fraudulent conveyance part of the statute. This is called constructive fraudulent conveyance. And all that it requires, I'm, I'm simplifying, is that the debtor receive less than reasonably equivalent value. And there are other Obviously, as you could tell, there are other factors, but the most common one is that the debtor is insolvent. Uh, that's the most common issue, um, that the debtor was insolvent. Uh, and why is that? Because if the debtor wasn't insolvent, uh, there wouldn't be a problem. Uh, then the bankruptcy estate could pay everybody. Uh, there's only a problem when, the, when the, the pie is not big enough to cut everybody an equal slice. That's the problem. 
Uh, so that's why insolvency is, is usually a major issue. Uh, otherwise, uh, there's no need for a trustee to protect anybody. Everybody's going to get paid in full in the bankruptcy. Well, this is my favorite part of the statute, 548C, provides a defense uh, to both 548 and 540, uh, 548A and 548B. Um, and basically, these are the golden words. It takes for value and in good faith. Um, lawyers bill thousands of hours, thousands of hours, and there are hundreds of opinions. Um, Try and figure out what that means. Okay, so how far can the trustee go back uh, to sue you for fraudulent conveyance? And what's a separate issue is what's the statute of limitations period under applicable state law? Like everything else in the bankruptcy code, it's very confusing. <laughs> I mean, basically what you have is, is a reach back period under the bankruptcy code but the bankruptcy code allows state law to apply as applicable state law to apply as well. And, and state laws have their own fraudulent conveyance law. And what they have is a statute of limitations, which is different from a reach back period. Why, why is it different? Because it's not going back. It's taking the date of the transfer and then deciding how long after that uh, you have to, uh, uh, to sue the transferee. So it, they, they kind of go in, in different directions a little bit confusing. Okay, the reach back period is in 548.1. It's two years from the date of the petition. I'm going to skip all the complexities here. That's, you know, and there are wrinkles and complexities, but generally speaking, it's, it's, it's two years for both actual and constructive uh, fraudulent conveyance uh, claims. However, and that's, I'll wait for my however. This is in uh, 548, as you can see. Now for my however, uh, the trustee can apply state law. Applicable state law under 544. And that's, that's the statute that allows the application of applicable uh, state law. State law varies on Fraudulent conveyance, not conveyance. There is a Uniform Fraudulent Conveyance Act. Um, there's also a Uniform Fraudulent Transfer Act. Uh, it really depends on the state. Uh, in Texas, uh, my favorite state, uh, the law provides for a four-year statute of limitations, which commences at the time of the transfer and expires in four years. So that's... Um, uh, the statute that's a statute of limitations not a reach back period it's a statute of limitations which is different okay throughout the video presentation i'm going to be going, I'm going, to be going into case law and uh, that's because this presentation is also being offered for a cle credit once it's approved um, so i'm going to be going into a lot of detail in case law uh, if you don't want to um, uh, uh, delve into the details of specific cases, which I'm using as examples, then just fast forward uh, through the case law. Um, if you are taking this course for CLE credit, uh, and obviously it's been approved in your state, uh, then obviously you have to watch the entire course. This is a, uh, a case from the Bankruptcy Court in uh, Southern District, Texas, Fifth Circuit. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of the facts. Basically, uh, this was some kind of internet uh, business that sold uh, uh, vitamins or nutrients. And apparently, uh, the debtor made personal payments from a business account. Trustee was appointed. Trustee sought to have this money brought back into the estate as a fraudulent transfer. Basically, the, re the reason I'm going through this case is to uh, review one of the defendant's arguments and the judge's reaction, and that is um, a statute of limitations and a reach back period argument. The court ruled that the two years uh, uh, reach back period uh, uh, resulted 
in that the transfers made, you know, the case was filed November 3rd, 2006. So November 3rd, 2004 was the reachback period. Any, and payments during that period were subject to avoidance. He also, uh, the judge also uh, looked at state law, state court, uh, I'm sorry, state law, and applied a slightly different, uh, with slightly different results. Under the Texas Business and Commerce Code, the applicable state law that the judge applied, um, uh, there was a four-year statute of limitations. So it's a different analysis. So the cause of action arose at the time the transfer was made, which was, was on July 30th, 2004. And the court found that um, uh, the statute of limitations expired July 30th, 2008. So uh, the court found that uh, transfers made during that period were subject to avoidance under state law. Another takeaway from that case in the fact pattern is that the trustees, since the stat, since according to the state statute, the trustee had until 2008 and he was appointed before that, that are filed in 2006, the trustee's time had not expired. If the trustee's time had expired pre-petition, that raises complexities we're not going to go into in this, in this particular video. Okay, I'm actually going to start with 548A1B, not A. A is actual fraudulent uh, conveyance, and B is constructive fraudulent uh, conveyance. Constructive fraudulent conveyance is really where most of the litigation happens, and uh, usually most of my focus is spent on that. Uh, but I'll be going into actual fraudulent conveyance as well later. So this is, again, this is the statute. Uh, uh, setting out the law on constructive fraudulent conveyance. Uh, these are the most common issues that we tend to focus on. Again, as in most parts of this video, it's a simplification uh, just for uh, just for the ease of, of, of communicating, uh, communicating basic concepts. Uh, the debtor receives less than reasonably equivalent value. So did it or didn't it? Uh, that's a question of fact. Um, you know, was it market value? Was it not market value? That's an important issue. Did the transferee act in, act in bad faith? In other words, if it's a Ponzi scheme, uh, did, did the transferee know that there was a Ponzi scheme? Or was he twisting elbows? Did he know there was going to be a bank? You know, did he know that there was something uh, not kosher, put it that way, uh, about the way he was getting paid? or about the whole business transaction. Um, so did he act in bad faith or was he totally innocent of everything? And just say, hey, you know, Madoff is a great guy. Uh, I golfed with him in Palm Beach and I'm just uh, glad, glad he's, he's doing so well for me. Insolvency of the debtor is another big issue. Uh, was the debtor insolvent or was it not insolvent? Uh, it involves evaluation of assets and, and it involves a complicated the uh, choice of methodologies, and it can be it can be a, a big issue in the case. Okay, uh, I just, same statute again. <laughs> Nothing's changed. Five forty eight A one B. I just highlighted received less than a reasonably equivalent value because that's what I'm going to focus on now. So that's the issue we're going to talk about. Okay, so an example of. Uh, uh, a Ponzi scheme and reasonably equivalent value. I call this the, uh, this, this is like the late night TV case. Uh, this is what I imagine being sold on infomercials at three in the morning to uh, widows and orphans. Anyway, marketing gold coins, some kind of a scheme, turns out uh, to be a Ponzi scheme. Investors, uh, each investor received at least three hundred and fifty dollars. So the, 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 the these aren't uh, hedge funds investing in these gold coins. This, this is small time stuff. Uh, they represented that represented a thirty five percent return, uh, which at the time must have looked terrific, until they were all sued by the trustee. Essentially, the court uh, looked at the facts, and uh, the trustee argued that the debtor 
didn't get anything uh, in return for paying out essentially a false profit to the investors and the investors did not provide any reasonably equivalent value uh, in exchange for receiving the false profit. And the judge agreed uh, because it was uh, a Ponzi scheme. And so the, uh, and so the investors had to return the false profit, uh, which is pretty, pretty much black letter law in the case of Ponzi schemes. Um, that's pr pretty subtle law throughout the country. Um, uh, what's less subtle is whether uh, the investor gets to keep uh, the original invest investment. And generally speaking, the investor does, uh, the, the original investment uh, is generally speaking not clawed back, uh, just the false profits. Uh, this is another kind of fraudulent conveyance case that I personally think is an abuse of the fraudulent conveyance laws. And the fact scenario here is you have two related companies, a parent company um, and a sub. So company uh, A and B, A being the parent, B being the sub, A contracts for a product or service, gets the product or service, and B pays for the product or service. But the product or service is given to company A, but these two companies are, are intimately connected. Um, and the argument by the trustee is, well, you know, company B paid for it, but it didn't get anything. All that, all the value went to company A. Um, and the way to argue against that is to argue, obviously, either that they're alter egos of each other or that company A, um, I'm sorry, that company B paid, but also received the benefit, uh, an equivalent benefit um, uh, from the transaction. I just find this to be an offensive use of the of the fraudulent conveyance laws. In my experience, it usually fails, but just costs defendants a ton of money. Well, these are the particular facts in this case. Debtors, a parent company uh, contracted uh, for services. The debtor was not a party to the contract. The debtor made the payments, not the parent company, hence the problem. And the uh, trustees sought to recover the payments because the debtor uh, did not re theoretically did not receive the services, was not part of the contract. Uh, the defendant uh, made the usual argument that the, the debtor derived an economic benefit from the transfers. And the, uh, the Court of Appeals uh, affirmed both the bankruptcy courts and the district courts ruling that the debtor received reasonably equivalent value in exchange for the payments. As such, the payments were not constructively fraudulent. Why? Because the debtor got, uh, received benefits as well. Um, anyway, that, that, this kind of fact pattern is, I see fairly often. Um, and it just uh, seems to me like a loophole, but that's just loophole in the fraudulent conveyance law, but that's just my personal opinion. Uh, next, I'm going to focus on the insolvency issue. This issue, if you're watching this video for basic concepts, again, you could skip this part of the video. This I would describe as more like a black belt or higher level fraudulent conveyance analysis. Um, and I'm gonna be going into you know, how insolvency is analyzed and disputed and looking at a couple of cases. First thing you have to know is there, there are two basic ways of uh, arguing whether a company is insolvent or not, um, establishing insolvency, and these two ways are the balance sheet test versus the going concern test. Uh, the balance sheet test assumes that the, that the business is basically dead and it's not applying any, any, uh, any additional value to the asset, to the assets. And it basically just looks at the balance sheet. And then, um, you know, the, this is a complicated area. I mean, people can dispute uh, what's on the balance sheet. Uh, are these receivable, collect, collectible, they're not collectible. Um, so there's a lot of litigation with respect to the balance sheet. Uh, the other test, and again, this is a simplification. The other test is called the going concern test. And that is, uh, what's the value of the business as a going concern? And that could be way, way more 
than the uh, than the assets as uh, valued from a liquidation uh, point of view. This case is an example. It's actually a preference clawback case. Example of the analysis that a court will do in deciding valuation of assets and whether the uh, whether the debtor was insolvent or solvent at the time of the transfers. So this this was a uh, a retailer of uh, home furnishings, a chain of stores, and payments were made uh, uh, right before the bankruptcy, and trustee was appointed, and then sued the uh, the transferees of the payments uh, for preferences and uh, alternatively constructive fraudulent transfers. So among other defenses uh, by the defendants uh, was that uh, uh, the debtor was not insolvent and both parties uh, submitted their uh, expert reports and this is what the judge had to say. Uh, the court, in his opinion, which is why I chose this case, uh, uh, made uh, sort of a short survey of uh, what a court is supposed to do in these circumstances and, and basically noted that uh, the court has to decide uh, and choose between a liquidation analysis or a going concern forward slash balance sheet analysis. And there's a very big difference. Uh, if the debtor is a going concern, then the court is going to look at market value. It's going to look at um, uh, the aggregate value of the business and the aggregate value of its assets. It's going to assume a reasonable amount of time to sell these assets. So it's, it's going to have that kind of evaluation. If the debtor is on its deathbed and not operating, then it's going to have a whole different methodology. It's going to look at a distressed sale and, you know, assets being so piecemeal on, on the courthouse steps, so to speak. So obviously the valuation of the assets is, is going to depend on um, whether the debtor is, uh, is determined to be a going concern or whether it's on the deathbed. And that's going to make a big difference to defendants. Um, obviously the defendants want higher asset values in hopes that the debtor was solvent, that its assets exceeded its liabilities, and, uh, and the plaintiff wants the opposite, wants to, wants to prove insolvency. Because remember, if the debtor was solvent, uh, then there can't be a preference or constructive fraudulent conveyance. There was, there was enough money to pay everybody. Uh, this, is a, this is basically just a cutout from the opinion So what is, how, how does the court uh, decide whether, uh, whether uh, this is a going concern or, 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 it's on, or on its deathbed, or, on, or, or whether the debtor is on its deathbed? Well, this is a complicated area and we're not gonna go, in this video, it's in a lot of detail. Basically, you know, almost always, this is the battle of the experts, experts are testifying. And basically, you know, some of the factors the court is looking as to whether the debtor had sufficient assets to keep operating for a reasonable period of time. That seems to be a salient factor. Um, uh, it, 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 other factors. Uh, for, for example, another factor is uh, the debtor did not report in this particular situation, did not report significant losses um, uh, prior to the bankruptcy. So, you know, this is a complicated analysis and it's basically expert testimony. I'm gonna go into a case um, that goes into a little bit more detail as to, and I thought it was a good example of uh, uh, how a court makes this analysis. Okay, uh, I'm gonna talk about a couple of cases quickly addressing the issue. Uh, whether a balance sheet test should be applied, a going concern value test, or whether uh, it should be a deathbed analysis. So this case is out of Illinois. I'm not going to go into the facts too much. Basically, the court found that uh, 
rents paid by the debtor, exceeded market value, a trustee was appointed and sued. Uh, apparently the landlord, landlord says, well, the debtor wasn't insolvent at the time of making payments, so case dismissed, or please dismiss the case. Uh, the court agreed. The court looked at the, did a, did a balance sheet analysis, found it was a going, decided it was a going concern, did a balance sheet analysis. Um, and although, although there were some uh, issues with contingent, uh, contingent liabilities uh, and assets to, to, uh, to pay them, uh, the court found that it was not a fraudulent transfer because uh, the debtor was shown not to be insolvent, had adequate capital and cash flow. So this is the takeaway here is obviously this is a, a, a can be a successful defense to a fraudulent uh, a transfer action, constructive fraudulent transfer action. Okay, well, here comes an example where this defense didn't work out as well. Um, uh, this is a company I'm sure you've heard of, Enron. It's one of the Enron clawback actions. And believe me, there were, there were a lot of them. I think there were thousands of them, as I remember. It was a while ago, but I, I defended quite a few of them. Anyway, this case was filed in Southern District, Southern District Texas. And uh, to make a long story short, the trustee was suing officers and employees that got uh, jumbo bonuses uh, right before the collapse of this company. Uh, which, uh, on, top, on top of other issues, uh, just does not work that great. Anyway, the defendants argued that the debtor was, was not insolvent um, and that uh, should be evaluated as a going concern. We'll see how that worked out. The court found that uh, did an analysis and that uh, uh, um, had some, the court had some reservation whether this was a, a going concern and noted a huge negative cash flow, you know, looked at a number of different factors. Credit rating was downgraded to non-investment grade, a credit grade. I heard testimony that uh, essentially, uh, you know, they'd lost their financial credibility. Uh, didn't, couldn't pay uh, loan debts, uh, everything was going to a uh, heck. And uh, you know, a litany of, of bad factors here. And the court decided there's just no way this is a going concern. Of course, of course, looking back, uh, it's not hard to agree with the court. Uh, and, um, and therefore, uh, the court applied a, uh, a deathbed uh, asset analysis and found that uh, the company was in fact insolvent and held in favor of uh, the friendly trustee in this case against uh, against these uh, masters of the universes. Uh, just a quick slide on the burden of proof as to the debtor's insolvency. First thing is in case of an actual Fraudulent conveyance, doesn't matter, so it's not relevant anyway. In case of constructive fraudulent conveyance, uh, which is the most popular flavor of proof of insolvency is relevant. And the way it works is that there is a presumption of insolvency uh, given to the trustee uh, for, uh, for a certain period of, of time prior to the bankruptcy case, uh, in which case the debtor is presumed to be insolvent um, and it's up to the defendant to challenge uh, that presumption of insolvency with some evidence. Uh, if the court finds that this presumption has been essentially defeated by some evidence, uh, I'm not going to go into the details of how much evidence, there's plenty of case law on that. I think that's a video in itself on insolvency. But um, then the court will say uh, that the, no, longer, <laughs> no longer a presumption. And again, then the burden becomes the plaintiff's burden of proving uh, insolvency. So that's kind of how that dance is played out. In this case, the debtor was uh, uh, manufactured uh, 
mobile homes and, man and manage mobile home parks and apparently made uh, transfers to certain uh, entities uh, prior to the bankruptcy. Trustees sought to avoid, that was actually stock, trustees sought to avoid the transfers and uh, defendants argued that the company was solid. The trustee uh, relied on a liquidation analysis and not a going concern value analysis. Uh, defendants argued that this was a going concern and that uh, uh, the asset should have a, uh, should be valued at a higher aggregate uh, value. And if they were valued that way, the company would be solid. Um, the trustee basically uh, held for the defendants and found that uh, even though the, the company operated uh, at a loss for a long period of time, um, that was not necessarily an indication of the potential uh, value of the, uh, of the company and that uh, should be valued as a going concern. Uh, so the transfers, uh, the constructive fraudulent transfer counts so were, uh, were dismissed. Unfortunately for the defendants, this was sort of a good news, bad news situation. Uh, the bad news was that the trustee had also sued for actual fraudulent conveyance. And just to hit, uh, uh, just to hit that point home, uh, this case is a good example uh, that uh, insolvency is irrelevant to an actual fraudulent conveyance. The court found that the debtor's president had, uh, had, in, had bad faith intent, fraudulent intent, um, and there were badges of fraud. I'll go into that later, uh, that kind of analysis. But I just wanted to show you that um, um, just because the company was found to be solvent, unfortunately for the defendants, it didn't help them because the court found that the debtor's president uh, engineered the transfers uh, with fraudulent intent. Okay, that case is a good segue back to actual fraudulent conveyance. So we're going to be talking about actual fraudulent conveyance for a while. And then we're going to be talking about the defenses and talk about that part of the statute and look at some cases there. So the first thing is, as to an actual fraudulent conveyance, uh, uh, what's the burden of proof? As far as the burden of proof, burden always rests with the plaintiff uh, on 548. There's no uh, presumption of any kind. Uh, plaintiff has to prove uh, actual fraudulent conveyance or constructive fraudulent conveyance. However, it's the burden on the defendant uh, to show uh, affirmative defenses. Okay, so trustee, generally speaking, the trustee is the one that's the plaintiff is going to have the burden. So how does he do that? How does he prove actual fraud? Uh, and we're going to focus on actual fraud, not constructive fraud uh, for the next few cases. Well, let's take a look at, it, at an example. Uh, some of you may have, uh, have remembered this uh, Ponzi scheme, the Bayou Superfund. Anyway, this is uh, from Southern District, New York, 2007. Um, facts of this case, the debtors were alleged to be in the trustee's complaint of Ponzi schemes um, that made the, the payments of uh, you know, false profits um, and uh, non-existent uh, principal to uh, various defendants. <coughs> trustee commenced the lawsuit and defendants moved to dismiss um, arguing that the complaint was not sufficiently or not adequately pled. In other words, not enough fraud details in the complaint. The plaintiff argued that uh, this was a Ponzi scheme and um, uh, by alleging in detail that it was a Ponzi scheme, um, he's already uh, satisfied uh, the uh, 9B rule, which requires that fraud be pled with particularity. Also, he argued that there was a, uh, a Ponzi scheme presumption at play, 
which presumes fraudulent intent. Um, defendants argued, well, it's not, not clear whether this was a classic Ponzi scheme or not, and that the case should be dismissed. Uh, the court basically, well, not basically, called, the, the court fully ruled in favor of the trustee uh, and found that uh, uh, adequately pledged that, there was, that this was a Ponzi scheme and that there's a presumption of fraudulent, of actual fraudulent intent. But even if the uh, uh, trustee had not alleged it was a Ponzi scheme, the court found that the plaintiff alleged sufficient badges of fraud, and that's a legal, that's not a legal term, it's a term of art uh, to indicate um, allegations of fraud. So they're generally called badges of fraud and opinions. And anyway, the court ruled that uh, uh, that there were sufficient badges of fraud in the complaint uh, to comply with the sufficiency requirements of Rule 9b. So what were the badges of fraud? And, and this is an example, I'm going to be going into that, so we may as well do it now, besides discussing the sufficiency of the complaint, but examples of badges of fraud. Never heard the profit, suffered heavy, heavy trading losses, principals siphoned off money for their own personal use, uh, boats, fancy cars, jet planes, the debtor intentionally disseminated false financial statements. So, these are sufficient uh, badges, of, badges of fraud um, to meet the uh, 9B requirement and also examples of badges of fraud. Well, this case is a good example of badges of fraud and what the court considers to be badges of fraud to show the intent required for an actual fraudulent conveyance. This is a situation where classic situation that I'm sure has been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, the debtor owned a printing company, wholly owned a printing company. Uh, things went south. Creditors were banging on the door and uh, out of the, he transferred property through the back door out of the house. In this case, transferred real property and cash uh, to his wife um, or someone or an entity controlled by his wife in the form of a trust. Of course, after the debtor files for bankruptcy, uh, which by the way was not a great not a, not a great plan here uh, because right away of course the trustee is appointed and sues the wife for a fraudulent conveyance. The trustee argues that the uh, transfer was made in fraudulent, uh, with fraudulent intent and the trustee submitted evidence in support of several badges of fraud. The debtor argued that the transfers um, were not actually fraudulent or constructively fraudulent because the debtor was solid. Uh, unfortunately for uh, the debtor and his wife, uh, the court noted that uh, insolvency is not an issue in actual fraud. I always feel sorry for these guys in a case like this. I mean, I know they're doing the wrong thing and everything, but you know, they're, they're not transferring out money to buy Learjets. He's trying to protect his family. Nonetheless, you know, it is what it is, and you can't, you know, I should feel sorry for the creditors, right? What about them? Anyway, the whole thing is a sad story, in my opinion. At any rate, uh, the trustee proved seven badges of fraud. Transfers were made to an insider that had retained possession of control of the property after the transfer, that it was inconsistent and attentive in its disclosure of the transfer, and that's not too surprising. It was pending litigation against the debtor. It goes on and on. The debtor received no consideration. Debtor. So uh, even if they, and the judge said, you know, even if you had a defense of insolvency, the judge is really, you know, putting in the last nail in the coffin here. Even if you had that defense, and you didn't have it, but if you did have it, it wouldn't have worked anyway. 
uh, just so I guess just so you don't feel too badly. Um, there was no this case defense was hopeless here basically. Uh, the defense did not refute uh, the badges of fraud and uh, and you can uh, guess the outcome. These are the statutory badges of fraud with regards to actual fraud and this is the list. This is the laundry list that you'll find. Uh, what's the takeaway? And this is not, there are other slides. This is part of the list. Transfer obligations to an insider. I'm not going to read them all. Um, but just so you know, there is a list. There's a laundry list. And the court, uh, what you need to know is that the court does not have to find all these badges of fraud. You can find some of them. Um, and it's and the court could still find that to be sufficient uh, to, uh, uh, for the uh, for the plaintiff to prove actual fraud. So those are the badges. And as you could tell in the last case, uh, the uh, trustee did not prove all of them, but approved enough of them. So as, as everybody knows, someone asked a Supreme, U.S. Supreme Court justice, uh, what's pornography? And the justice uh, responded, I know it when I see it. And uh, <laughs> I think this is kind of the same thing. Uh, enough badges of fraud, and it's pretty obvious uh, that there was an actual intent uh, to uh, perpetrate a fraudulent uh, conveyance. Well, you know, constructive fraud is a whole different animal. Here, here the trustee, and I'm simplifying here again, is often uh, showing a couple of things. In constructive fraud or conveyance, the trustee really, I mean, and I'm simplifying a lot, but typically the trustee really needs to only show less than reasonably equivalent value and that the debtor was insolvent. Uh, and then, uh, defense has to prove its affirmative defenses that uh, it was for reasonably equivalent value and uh, that the defendant acted in good faith. Defenses to uh, a fraudulent conveyance action. What we did was, was cover um, what a trustee needs to show, what he needs to prove, and now we'll look at what a defendant needs to prove uh, to present a successful defense to uh, a fraudulent advance action, whether actual or constructive. First thing, we've already covered a number of times, reasonably equivalent value. I, I picked this case for a specific reason, not only because it goes into the issue of reasonably equivalent value as a defense, but it also is in the context of an actual fraudulent conveyance uh, lawsuit under uh, 548A. And it's an example that the law is, or it's illustrative of the fact that the law is not really settled in this area. Um, and I'll go into specifics on the next slide. In this situation, the debtor was found to have operated a Ponzi scheme. That are pre-bankruptcy pre paid uh, defendant Golf Channel to provide advertising services. Um, bankruptcy was filed, trustee is appointed, and the trustee sought to avoid the money that was paid to the advertising, uh, to, to the Golf Channel under the Texas Uniform Fraudulent Transfer Act as an actual fraudulent a transfer with actual intent. The Golf Channel, um, uh, in its defense, argued that uh, it transferred, uh, first of all, acted in good faith, was an innocent trade creditor, also provided reasonably equivalent value uh, of its uh, advertising services at market value. Um, the plaintiff didn't dispute any of that. It just argued that since this was a Ponzi scheme, uh, the Golf Channel didn't provide any value because all it did was bring in more victims to the Ponzi scheme. And as I, we went over that a few slides before, 
uh, just had more people and the, and the same size pie. Uh, so it didn't do, it didn't help. Um, this, has, this case has an interesting procedural history. Uh, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals had previously uh, decided that the Gulf Channel did not provide reasonable value for the, for the reason I just described. Um, uh, the Court of Appeals bought that argument. On rehearing, the Fifth Circuit Court vacated its own ruling um, and basically asked the Supreme Court of Texas to consider the issue and, uh, and make a determination as to the uh, as to the Texas statute, which was the basis of the plaintiff's fraudulent conveyance action. So the plaintiff was using um, the fraudulent conveyance statute uh, found in uh, in Texas. Basically, the court decided. Um, that uh, value was given uh, by the Gulf Channel and the court uh, declined to follow uh, the opinion of, uh, of the Court of Appeals and, and the reasoning that just because it was a Ponzi scheme that there was no value uh, given by the, uh, by the Gulf Channel. The court specifically found that Tufta, which is the Texas Uniform Fraudulent Transfer Act, which is different from, from the Uniform Fraudulent Transfer Act, which is AFTA, uh, specifically defines the term reasonably equivalent value to include consideration from a marketplace perspective. And so the court looked at, was there an arm's length contract? Um, did the product or service have objective value? Was it made in the ordinary course? Those kind of factors. And the court concluded that in this case, uh, that was certainly the case. And so the court found uh, that it was not a fraudulent conveyance. Now, this is the Supreme Court of Texas interpreting the Texas fraudulent conveyance statute. So that's an interpretation of the uh, Texas fraudulent conveyance statute. On the other hand, the Fifth Circuit um, has not rendered a new opinion yet. Uh, it would seem to me that the Fifth Circuit could render an opinion on how they view um, uh, uh, the issue of reasonable equivalent value in the context of a Ponzi scheme um, uh, with respect to the bankruptcy code. 548 section. Um, what they received was a ruling uh, which they do need to um, apply regarding the Texas fraudulent conveyance statute. So they can still make their own determination, as far as I can tell, uh, on 548 and how that works. And uh, I guess we'll find out. I guess that was a slide too early because that's exactly what the slide says. Just as a reminder, 548C is the defenses. The statute has takes for value. It doesn't have takes for reasonably equivalent value, but that's how the court the court treated it, treats it at, treats the defense as not just any value, reasonably equivalent and in good faith. Okay, this is another example of, uh, of uh, the defense being presented of reasonably equivalent value from the great state of Florida, Middle District. This is yet another, guess what, Ponzi scheme. Uh, this one involved uh, 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 selling notes and the, the way this one worked, this scheme worked through a um, network of brokers. Uh, in other words, the debtor recruited brokers to uh, to sell the notes, and uh, of course promised uh, 
promised uh, a significant return. And uh, eventually the company went bankrupt. Uh, it was found to be a Ponzi scheme. And meanwhile, the brokers um, uh, earned some pretty significant commissions. The trustee uh, sued the individual brokers under 548 A and B. Um, in other words, sued the brokers for an actual fraudulent conveyance and for constructive fraud under the bankruptcy code and under uh, Florida statute. Trustee argued uh, that with respect to actual fraud, that this was, you know, clearly a Ponzi scheme, uh, that uh, um, you know, it was a pyramid type of Ponzi scheme, and uh, there was clear fraudulent intent on in part of the debtor. As to the constructive fraud count, trustee argued that uh, the debtor didn't receive any value from these brokers. Uh, debtor, uh, debtor just got more victims, and so the bankruptcy estate did not receive any value. So it's uh, so the, the golf channel argument. The defendant argued, well, you know, we're just brokers. Uh, we didn't know there was anything wrong here. A reasonably equivalent value. We did our jobs. We sold the notes. We acted in good faith. Uh, how, do we, how are we supposed to know uh, that, uh, that this was a Ponzi scheme? Well, good news and bad news. Uh, uh, the bad news first. Uh, the court found that there was actual fraud. It was an actual fraud one conveyance. And the real bad news is that the court found that the defendant brokers did not act in good faith. Uh, why? Why, even though, even though uh, they really didn't know there was a Ponzi scheme? Because they didn't take the steps to find out. The court found, hey, turning, turning a blind eye is not sufficient. Um, there was enough information to put them on notice, and uh, they didn't do the minimal due diligence. They didn't do anything. They just sold the stuff and pocketed the commissions. And according to the court, uh, it's just not, not a def the defense of good faith is just not available to these guys. The court went into the, the issue of the due diligence required or reasonable investigation by a reasonably prudent broker. Uh, should have reviewed the available investment ratings uh, uh, of these uh, of this, of this uh, entity. Uh, also, should have uh, taken a look at the financial statement. That's excuse me, financial statements of the company and other literature, and did some research there. Looked at the background of the of the employees of the officers. Um, uh, they shouldn't have relied uh, just on the uh, on the slick uh, material. Uh, put out by the debtor. And so the court found it's just not convinced that, the, that these guys acted in bad faith. Um, uh, more was required in this, in this particular uh, case with these particular facts. The uh, court found that uh, they had to do more than, than just sell the notes. And, and apparently you know, they didn't do enough. I love it when a court tells you that uh, you just lost and basically there's no hope and these these commissions are going to be avoided. Oh, but by the way, you won on the constructive fraudulent count. Um, so what? Basically, the court said um, they did. They were performing their usual jobs. Um, uh, they were essentially saying they did provide value. The debtor did receive the benefit of the bargain. Um, but because it was an actual fraudulent conveyance, none of that matters. Uh, whether they were innocent, whether they did a good job, um, according to the code, according to the court, there is a minimal due diligence uh, required in a situation like this of a reasonably prudent broker, and it just wasn't done. So the commissions were avoided by the trustee.
Well, this is a, a case is a good segue into focusing on the issue of good faith. When is a defendant in a fraudulent conveyance case found to be in good faith and when not? 548C, and in good faith. What does it mean? Okay, let's take a look at the Reinhardt case as an example. This is from Illinois in 2002. Yet again, another Ponzi scheme, this time involving paid telephones, the sale of paid, paid telephones. These guys are creative, nothing else. Anyway, again, the defendant acted as a broker for the debtor. Uh, the debtor recruited a bunch of brokers. Uh, this was one of the brokers. And uh, uh, so what's going to be the outcome in this case? The usual dance, the trustee uh, pleads constructive fraud and actual fraud. And what's unusual here is summary judgment. That's fairly unusual. Uh, brokers argued that uh, acted as a broker, or one particular broker argued that he acted as a broker. Uh, he recruited in good faith. He had no knowledge of the fraudulent scheme. I call that the Sergeant Schultz defense. I know nothing. Uh, also provided the value for his services. Okay, so uh, the first thing the court found was that uh, the actual fraud was not sufficiently pled, uh, which actually usually is an opinion in response to a motion to dismiss, but this was a motion for summary judgment. Anyway, the court said it doesn't, wasn't well pled, uh, but doesn't matter because the court ruled on it anyway. As to the constructive fraud count, uh, the court found that the defendant provided value by recruiting investors in these, in these pay telephones, performing follow-up with the activities with the recruited investors um, and that uh, there was an arm's length transaction to pay commissions and they deserve the commissions essentially. Um, uh, the court held though that even if uh, uh, the trustee had adequately pled actual fraudulent conveyance, uh, it doesn't matter, the brokers would uh, take shelter behind 548C. Why is that? Well, uh, they, they took the commissions of good faith and, and provided value. There's the defense under 548C. And uh, this is a cutout from the opinion. And uh, in this case, uh, <laughs> the I can't help laughing just a little bit because the court is blaming the investor. Hey, you should have known better. Uh, if this deal was too good to be true, don't try to blame the uh, broker or the debtor, uh, you're, you're equally at fault here. And so here the, here the court totally sided uh, with the brokers um, uh, based on a summary judgment and uh, um, uh, ruled, on, ru 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 ruled, on, uh, ruled on the issue in favor of the, uh, in favor of the brokers. Uh, the court also noted that the commissions er earned uh, were similar, uh, basically uh, industry standard, um, and that uh, and the defendant uh, and the broker performed services without any knowledge. And in this case, uh, for whatever reason, the issue of due diligence um, uh, was did not come up, and. Uh, and the court found that the broker acted uh, in good faith and provided value. 548C prevailed, and the broker's summary motion for summary judgment uh, was granted. I always like to see that. There was no allegation that the defendant knew about the Ponzi scheme or that there was fraudulent activity. Therefore, the court did not need to go into the issue of due diligence by the defendant. Here's another case involving uh, 
fraudulent conveyance and the good faith issue. Again, another Ponzi scheme, uh, this time involving the sale of mortgages, or I guess fake mortgages. Also, this case involves, again, a group of brokers, a network of brokers that defend, who receive commissions uh, for, uh, for getting, uh, I should say, getting new victims, getting new clients. At that time, the defense alleged they didn't know. So they're getting new clients, new customers. And the question is, uh, do these brokers have to return the uh, commissions? Trustee argued that uh, since this was a Ponzi scheme, is presumption of fraudulent intent, uh, that the defendant brokers um, didn't have to have any knowledge of the Ponzi scheme. Uh, and there, and uh, there really isn't an issue of uh, consideration uh, uh, a la uh, Golf Channel, a la the Golf Channel trustee argument. Um, and the defendant brokers argued, uh, by the way, the trustee sued for both actual and constructive fraudulent conveyance. The brokers moved to dismiss. And as part of the motion for, to dismiss, uh, they argued that, uh, of course, uh, uh, we didn't know anything was going on. And number one, we didn't know there was any fraudulent intent. And uh, we performed our work, uh, provided value, had an arm's length agreement. Um, so what did the court find here? Uh, there was no allegation that the defendant brokers uh, knew or should have known that the um, that the debtor was engaged in a fraudulent scheme. Uh, so uh, there was no requirement for the court to go into the uh, uh, due diligence issue. Well, the court granted the motion to dismiss. Court, court said um, uh, the, the plaintiff did not plead um, that the brokers had bad faith or that they didn't supply a value and therefore could not continue with the constructive fraudulent conveyance part uh, of the complaint. However, it denied the motion uh, for the actual fraudulent conveyance part. Also, didn't dismiss the preference claims. This is another opinion with respect to good faith. In this case, the court, and this is a very recent case, uh, Virginia 2014. Uh, this is a circuit level case. And the court looked at due diligence. This, in, this, in this case, um, the debtor before filing for bankruptcy was in the business allegedly or supposedly of originating mortgages, selling mortgages um, to uh, financial institutions. And the, the buyer of the mortgage was known as a warehouse lender. Um, so that's what was going on here. Unfortunately, uh, it turned out that this company uh, was apparently selling uh, fake mortgages uh, to these warehouse lenders. Um, and um, uh, the trustee, you know, the company went bankrupt, trustee was appointed. And the trustee uh, sought to claw back payments made to one of the warehouse lenders in repayment of one of the mortgages. The trustee argued that this was an actual fraudulent conveyance with fraudulent intent. Uh, of course, the defendant bank pled good faith and, um, uh, and value. Uh, the court focused on the good faith um, uh, element of the, of the bank's defense. 
Here the court essentially focused on the due diligence issue. Uh, was the defendant bank aware? Or should it have been aware? Uh, should it have taken steps to find out? Were there any red flags um, uh, showing uh, that uh, this was uh, some kind of a fraudulent enterprise? And did the bank uh, just um, uh, decide to ignore that and, uh, and take the money and run? So that was the issue here. And there was expert testimony as there normally would be, I think, in due diligence, uh, with respect to a due diligence issue and what is required in due diligence. So the defendant provided an expert and basically painted the picture of the industry in 2000, 2008, which was dire. Um, and that uh, apparently this company was delaying selling their mortgage loans. And the issue was, well, was this sufficient information to put the bank on notice? Um, and the court concluded, uh, no, uh, the bank, the bank, uh, uh, was adequately apprised of the relevant facts of the situation and they didn't raise any red flags. So it wasn't a question of turning a blind eye. Uh, defendant bank, uh, acted in good faith. Uh, there's one important aspect of the reach back period and the statute of limitations under applicable state law that I think is important that it needs to be at least um, raised in this video, and that is the discovery rule and equitable tolling of the limitation period. A lot of state fraudulent conveyance actions have a, have a specific provision that the statute of limitations is tolled uh, if the plaintiff uh, would not reasonably have had notice of the fraudulent conveyance. And trustees use this uh, in to enable them to uh, essentially extend the statute of limitations um, a longer period so that they're able to bring lawsuits. So let's take a look at a case. Uh, this is, what else, a Ponzi scheme. Wing versus Doc Stater, Utah case, 2010. Okay, so in this case, the defendant provided contact information uh, to the debtor and uh, potential clients, and uh, he was paid for that. And what's interesting here is that the defendant also uh, invested in the debtor's business. U.S., I'm sorry, the SEC filed suit and a receiver is appointed. Um, and the question is, is the and then the receiver files a case and the question is, uh, can he still file this case? He files it October 6, 2008. Among other arguments, and you can imagine there's obviously, I'm sure there was a good, there was a good faith argument um, uh, argues that as a four-year statute of limitations and trustee is barred. The trustee decided that, uh, I'm sorry, the court decided uh, that the trustee uh, was not barred uh, since he was appointed on May, he was appointed on May 5th and he could not have found out about these fraudulent transfers uh, before May 5th, that's when he was appointed. And otherwise, um, the statute of limitations had run out uh, way before he was appointed. And so uh, applying applicable state law in Utah, uh, district court found that, uh, uh, that, the, that the trustee, that the, I'm sorry, that the statute of limitations was in fact told uh, pursuant to uh, uh, the applicable fraudulent conveyance law in Utah. And the court concluded that uh, uh, he could still uh, bring the action. The last issue I'm going to touch upon is the jurisdiction, the jurisdiction of bankruptcy courts with respect to fraudulent transfer claims. And this is, this is quickly evolving law and the law has changed 
uh, fairly recently. The current law is that the bankruptcy court has no jurisdiction to render final rulings uh, over fraudulent conveyance claims, uh, either under the bankruptcy code or applicable to state law. Um, it can render proposed findings of facts and recommendations, but the bankruptcy court can only transfer these to the district court. And the district court has to review the case de novo, uh, which means you can't really have a trial in bankruptcy court because the district court has to review, can't just review a transcript. He's got to see the witness. The district court judge has to see the witness. So uh, you don't really have any more trials in fraudulent conveyance in bankruptcy court unless the parties agree. I'll go into that in a second. Uh, it's a U.S. Supreme Court case that decided this, Stern v. Marshall, and that was in 2011. Um, but the Wellness International Network case, 2015, just a couple of years ago, decided the bankruptcy court can acquire jurisdiction if the defendants knowingly and voluntarily consent uh, to this jurisdiction. Otherwise, he, he ain't got it. Um, he's got to render proposed findings of facts and conclusions of law at the close of discovery. That's it for this basic overview of fraudulent conveyance law. I hope you found it useful. Uh, if you have specific questions about your case, if, if, uh, if I'm not retained, uh, you can't ask me and don't email me. <laughs> if, if I am retained, then I'll be glad to talk about it with you.